Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar on cattle handling with Professor Temple Grandin. Uh, I'm Steve West from AHDB Dairy and I'll introduce you to Temple in just a moment. Let's go through some housekeeping and explain the background to what we have in store for you over the next few weeks on this subject. All of you are muted and this webinar is being recorded so you can share it afterwards. Uh, for dairy farmers registered with Dairy Pro, pre please provide your details uh, in the message box on the right. You can ask questions um, and only the organisers will see them, uh, so you can ask them in confidence. Now, um, the question box is on the right. Uh, it's the box that opens when you click on the orange arrow. Uh, we, we have uh, around 700 of you listening at this present moment and there, there's plenty more coming in. Uh, so I am expecting a lot of questions, uh, so please understand if we don't manage to get to yours. Uh, but don't let that put you off. Uh, we want as many questions as possible and we will put as many as we can to, to Temple. Um, so this meeting uh, is about cattle. So of course I'm expecting we've got both beef and dairy levy payers listening. Uh, there are two more webinars in the series, uh, as you can see just over my left shoulder here. Um, Next week on the 16th of February, at the same time, we have Neil Chesterton, uh, the dairy vet behind Lame Cow Consultancy in New Zealand. And on the 2nd of March, we have Jörp Driesen from Cow Signals in the Netherlands. Now, both of these webinars are directed more toward dairy farms, uh, but they'll cover different elements of cattle handling that I know Temple will touch on today. Um, I'm afraid we're not going to be able to record either of those two webinars uh, that are coming up. Uh, so you must listen live in order to avoid disappointment. Um, the details are at the top and I'll go through that a little bit more at the end of the webinar today. Now, um, one of the challenges with any webinar, I think it's a big problem, is that um, you have a lack of interaction, don't you? And um, we're offering all dairy farmers who are listening the opportunity to sign up to a focus group with Miriam Parker from Livestock Wise, uh, which will be hosted on Microsoft Teams on the 24th of February. Uh, here you can discuss some of the take home messages that will come out of today's webinar. Um, and, and we can of course tailor it to, to your on-farm environment. Now places are limited to 30 uh, and details of how to book uh, will be uh, added to the chat box a little bit later in this webinar and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on and as to how to book. Um, beef farmers, we don't want to leave you out. Uh, any, any beef farmers who are interested, please do email your details to the same, uh, the same place, register your interest and we'll try to fulfil what's needed on another suitable date. Uh, I'll go into a little bit more detail on that at the end of today, but um, that's enough from me really. I, I, I want to just quickly explain who our speaker is this evening. Um, Professor Temple Grandin of Colorado State University. Now, Temple Grandin is a world-renowned animal behaviorist and designer of cattle handling facilities. Her writings on the flight zone and other principles of grazing behavior have helped many people to reduce stress on their animals during handling globally. She has appeared in countless primetime US TV programs and publications, including People magazine, New York Times and Forbes. In fact, Time, Manage Time magazine uh, named Temple as one of the top 100 most influential people in 2010. She has authored over 400 articles and took part in a TED lecture in 2010 entitled The World Needs All Kinds of Minds. Her life story has also been made into an HBO movie, which I'd certainly recommend. It's entitled Temple Grandin and it stars Claire Danes. Now this won seven Emmy Awards and a Golden Globe. In 2017, she was inducted into the Women's Hall of Fame and in 2018, made a fellow by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome you this evening, Temple, uh, and I'll hand over to you to take us through your presentation. Well, it's really great to be here by, um, um, by virtual, absolutely wonderful. And I wanna to talk to you about um, stockmanship and cattle handling. And there'll be uh, quite a few beef cattle in here. But a lot of the things I talk about 
are the same for all animals. And I want to go to our next slide, which shows something that appeared on our campus. And the reason why I'm showing this is I want to talk about the importance of becoming a really good observer. Those are eclipse shadows through a tree. And the tree acts like little pinhole cameras. Well, I didn't know eclipses made these weird shadows. I noticed these shadows. I watched probably 100 students walk over this. This was right in front of our library. They didn't see these weird shadows that the eclipse was making. And it's really important for in stockmanship to be a good observer. I know you're gonna have cow signals like um, a talk and uh, he talks about the importance of observing, you know, the, the animal's body posture and other things. I'm a visual thinker. Everything I think about is a picture. It's not in words. Animals live in a sensory based world, not a word based world. And cattle are very, very sensitive to things they see, little things that move rapidly that might scare them, things that we would tend to not notice, like a little cup on the ground, a paper towel hanging out of a rack. The next slide shows some really, really calm, totally stress free cattle handling. Uh, there's no fear. Now, we talk about animals getting agitated. Well, that's fear. Animals feel fear. Animals definitely do have emotions. There's some no fear. You lead them around with the feed bucket. Now, when you got them that tame, you got to be really careful about their manners. You cannot have these heavy animals pushing and shoving on people. And one of the mistakes that people make is they'll put the feed down when they're pushing and shoving. Then you've rewarded pushing and shoving. So if you're changing pastures, you wait until they stand back a little bit, and then you open the gate. They've got to ask nicely. Now. The next picture shows, um, I took down in Mexico a lot of years ago. And uh, you get a horse there, gonna get really stressed. I think the guy just got his pride hurt. But with a saddle suddenly coming off the horse, and I haven't had the camera either right at the right time or maybe the wrong time, no matter how you wanna look at this. But something sudden, like that saddle coming off, that's really scary. That's sudden novelty. And uh, once an animal gets really frightened, it takes 20 to 30 minutes for them to calm back down. So maybe it might be a good time to take a break, but sudden novelty. When I worked in a dairy one day, the cattle were just freaking, they wouldn't come into the milking parlor. And the problem was somebody hung a yellow raincoat up in there that had never been there before. Next slide shows some of the signs of fearful cattle. The first thing they'll do is put their head up, looking all around, ears pinned back, and then the next thing they'll do is they'll start to switch their tails. That's all they'll tell you when they get ready to kick you. And then when they start pooping, they're really scared because you scared the you know what out of them. And when you see eye white, though on some of the Holsteins, the way their eyes are made, you can see eye white naturally. But on other breeds of cattle, you see eye white, they are getting scared. And it's sort of like a pot coming to a boil. And then kaboom, you're working with training animals, training a horse, they start to switch their tail you might want to end the training session before he bucks you off. Now I'm going to show you some lighting things. And this next slide shows going straight into the sun. You've all been out on the motorway where you had to drive directly into the sun and it was just awful. I, you might want to change the time of day that you load the trailer so you can avoid going into the sun. Time of day, it can make a big difference. Another thing that can make a big difference is shadows. My student, um, Dennis Wilson, just um, finished up a survey and he found that when the sun made really sharp shadows of maybe the bars of fences, cattle that had not been in that facility before would balk at it. Now, you know, dairy, you might have a drain on the floor. The old cow will just walk right over it, but the new heifer, she's going to stop at it, give her a chance to look at it. So get down in your facilities and see what they're seeing. And right here, they can see a car parked outside the facility. Vehicles parked along facilities can often be a problem. There's also a little red piece of string. Little things we tend to not notice, uh, they will notice. And in a dairy, the animals that are gonna notice this the most are the new heifers. The next slide shows a chain hanging down. Yep, an animal that's uh, first coming in, gonna balk at that. Also, objects can change how they look when they change position. Another one of my students, Megan Corgan, just got finished doing a study with horses where she walked them by a children's play set. And after they got used to walking by it, 
she rotated it and it became a new object. Think about it. Let's say we had a giant, you know, three meter long stapler. This is what it looks like this way. Looks different this way. See, when you turn it, it looks different. Well, you have an object that looks different when you turn it, the animal might treat it as a new object. The next slide shows going into a dark building. This can be especially a problem on bright, sunny days. At night, you put lights inside this building, the cows are gonna go in there just fine. Um, on a real bright, sunny day, you can have, have a problem because their eyes have to adjust. I call this the dark movie theater effect. Now, I haven't been to a movie for over a year because of COVID, but you can all remember I'm going in a dark theater and you can't see anything. Well, the animal is the same way. So the next slide shows things that you could do about this. You can put in some translucent panels so they can see some light through the building. They can see light through the building. They'll go in there more easily. My next slide shows animals stopping at a, at a water puddle on a pasture. And what you need to do here is give that leader a chance to put the head down and take a look at the water. If you push the leader when they've got the head down, they're not going to go. you got to wait for the leader to bring the head back up. Then you push them. Then you go, oh, I don't have time for that. Well, you have time for them to turn back on you. Let the leader look at the puddle, and then the, the leader will go across, and then the other cattle will follow. The next slide shows a backstop gate uh, at the entrance to a chute. And off or race, we'll use the term race, those cause more problems than they solve because they don't like going through them. So in this situation, you might want to put a remote control rope on that backstop gate so you can hold it open for the cattle and then close it behind them. It's a little remote control rope, really, really simple. The next slide emphasizes the importance of bringing up small groups. This is especially important on, you know, when you're doing vaccinations, people bring too many up. And, and what I have to find out, you know, whenever I work with beef cattle is I have to find out what's the correct number to bring up. And people also put too many into the holding pen for the milking parlor too and jam them in there. Good handling is gonna require more walking. So I've got this cute little picture of one dog walking the other dog. Um, because to really do handling well, you're gonna to need to bring up small groups and that's going to take more time. People don't want to do the walking. And sometimes people say to me, well, why does Temple Grand then have to keep talking about the same stuff all the time? Because people are still bringing too many up and doing other things that we have to keep talking about. The next slide, I emphasize uh, filling the crowd pen half full. And I find that that's something I have to constantly stay after people about that, to bring the small groups up. Now, the next few slides I'm going to show, I'm going to show flight zone principles. We go to the next slide, big um, flock of sheep. And you can see how in these animals that are not completely tame, the flight zone makes a bubble. And there's a number of people teaching low stress handling that talk about how to position yourself so that the animals will just flow around the bubble. And the size of that bubble is going to vary. Now, of course, that animal that was so tame that the lady could lay on top of it, uh, that is no flight zone at all those you're going to have to lead. But what affects the size of this bubble is amount of contact with people, the genetics of the animal, the more flighty animals will stand further back, also the quality of the handling. Is it quiet and low stress or is it rough? The next slide shows using the bubble concept to move some animals out of a pen. And you can see there how they're just flowing around the bubble. Now on my website, grandon.com, I got lots of free videos and stuff on grandon.com. I actually have a video of this same slide and you can see how the cattle walk around the bubble. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Now this uh, next slide on the flight zone is kind of a busy slide and I don't have any way of using a pointer, unfortunately, but the dotted curved lines shows a single file race of, that the animal would walk through. And you've got a point of balance at the shoulder. Now, the big mistake I see people do is stand at the head and poke them on the butt. This is another thing I have to keep talking about because people still keep making these same mistakes. 
Now, there was a big survey done in the U.S. and Texas. They went to 39 feed yards, and they looked at how well people handled cattle. And you still had 20 or 30 percent of the people that stand at the head and poke it on the butt. And you're telling it to go forward and backwards at the same time. Now, the gray area on that represents the flight zone. If you stand inside the flight zone, um, some animals are going to get kind of excited. And then the dotted line is way out on the very edge of the flight zone. So the next slide, I'm going to be able to show you sort of three different zones that are around the animals. These black cattle are moving away. I've it penetrated their flight zone. But notice that the tan, light-colored animal is looking at me. He knows I'm there. Then you've got some other cattle far away that they don't pay any attention to me. So there's kind of two zones. There's the flight zone where they move away. But then there's a zone of influence, a zone of awareness or a pressure zone. People call it different things, but there's the flight zone when they move away, and then, and then there's the zone of, yeah, I want to look at you. I'm aware that you're there. And they'll tend to turn and look at you and stay just outside the flight zone. The next slide shows a very handy way to get animals to move forward when they're in a single file race. And this is a really good thing to use, and it'll enable you to get rid of a lot of electric prods and other bad things. These diagrams are on my website, grandon.com. Just my last name, grandon.com. And what you do is you walk quickly back past the shoulder in the opposite direction of desired movement. Kind of counterintuitive, but it works. You start using this, you'll be amazed at how well you can move cattle and put away some of the driving aids that you shouldn't be using. Now, of course, in a dairy, I don't want to see any electric prods. And the one thing I never want to say is electric pride is someone's primary driving tool. Get them out of your hands. The next slide shows a, a race that has a solid outer fence so that when people park the vehicles all along there, um, they don't see the vehicles. Now, if you have an open side on the chute, you have to kind of imagine that the flight zone comes out sort of like a force field. Remember that picture I showed of that bubble? And if you stand in that in that bubble, when they're in there, they're gonna start getting agitated, maybe jump around, maybe start pooping. And you have to stay outside of their flight zone until it's time to move them. You can walk in there, move them, and then back up. I have found in a facility like this where you have an open side, I can draw a line in the dirt. And if I stand inside the line, they start to get agitated or fearful. Back up outside the line, then they stay calm. And the next slide shows why you need to have a solid outer fence. This is a picture I took down in Australia. So that's why the truck looks very different. But as the cattle came up the single file race to get vaccinated, they could see the big truck there. And this feed yard had two facilities, exactly the same design. This one, there was a lot of blocking and backing up and the other one worked. But the other facility was inside a building. So the cattle didn't see things. The next slide shows an animal rearing in a single file race. And the reason why that animal's rearing is because the handler is too close. That animal's trying to get away. So what you need to do is back up, get out of the flight zone. The next slide, I just talk about the optimal length for a single file race. I wanna have it long enough so I can use some following behavior. So I can put a few animals in there and following behavior is a really important thing to use. I want to wait until it's almost empty. Then when I bring up the next bunch of cattle, they just go right on in. They go right on in. Now, here's another little trick you can try with a piece of cardboard that I show on my next slide. Um, I've got a squeeze chute with open sides, and you're standing there working it. And you put a piece of cardboard there. So an animal coming in with it so they can't see you. That can help try experimenting sometimes with pieces of cardboard. Then you find something that works. Then you can put something on there that's a little more permanent than cardboard. Sometimes very simple changes in your facility can make a big difference. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of having a non-slip floor. It is just essential. Got to have a non-slip floor. Um, temple, Temple, yeah. do, you, do you mind if I just ask a question? There? Yeah, no We've problem. Got a no problem. Got quite a few questions coming in, um, but uh, just to, to break that up, um, in terms of uh, sort of cattle, in terms of emotional behaviour, where do they? I mean, you've you've shown 
slides with horses, you've shown slides with sheep. Where, where do cattle sort of sit in terms of emotional behavior compared to pigs, horses, They dogs? all have emotional behavior. Right. And I'm going to be showing a slide. Um, I'll, I'll give you a preview. We'll, we'll wait for this. I'll, let me just talk about motions. There will be a slide that's going to be coming up where I talk about the pants gap emotions. All people and all animals have this. I don't know about earthworms, but you know. Okay. Sheep, okay. Cats, we'll stop. We'll stop. Things like that. You have fear. And when you're okay. handling animals, most of the problems are fear. But another one of the emotions is separation distress. That's a separate emotion. You take the calf away from the mother and they're upset. That's not fear. It's actually a different brain system. So there's two emotions that when you're handling animals, you're going to run into fear. And that is a proper scientific word. It's been in the neuroscience literature forever. And separation distress. Like you have one lamb separated from the herd, or one dairy cow just got off by herself and she's upset about it. That's separation distress. You know, now COVID's been really, really good for um, animals. Um, but now one of my uh, friends um, got a really nice dog and she got a job. The dog was home alone. It chewed up her pajamas. That was, that was yesterday. That was um, separation distress. It was certainly not fear. And they are scientifically, uh, fear and separation distress are two separate emotional systems, and they're both negative. They're definitely not positive emotions. And when I get to the emotion slide, I will go into some of the positive emotions. But Lovely. animals have emotions. There's no question about that. Well, I'll hold on to that question then and until... Um that moment and I'll let you continue Temple. You want so. to go on another some other question? You said you had a bunch of questions. I can't uh, well, questions, so I'll ask you another quick one then while we're at right. it. Let's just, let's, so you you've talked about a leader cow. Um the the cow that needed to see the water, the puddle. Yeah. What how do you recognize the leader cow? Well the leader cow and the dominant cow at the feed trough are not the same cow. The leader cow, and this brink gets into emotions, is kind of a low fear, bold cow that likes to explore. So there's another one of the Jack Pence cap emotions, which is seek. And there's actually been research done in cattle where GPS collars were put on cattle. This was out in New Mexico, in the state of New Mexico on you know, really rough range. And some cows would go out and graze a lot of pasture and others were lazy and lay around the water hole. So that's gonna be a high seek and a low seek. And that leader tends to be, you know, likes to explore, probably lower fear. Now, if the herd gets attacked by wolves or dogs or some other predator, that dominant cow at the feed trough, she will be in the center of the herd where she's protected. The I dominant see. cow does not lead the herd across something like water. She's gonna let somebody else do that. I mean, think about the wildebeest herds in Africa. Well. The dominant cow is going to let the crocodiles get, or the alligators, or whatever, get somebody else. I see. I see. No, that's tremendous. I, I, I've got a few more questions, but I'm going to hold on to those, Temple, because I know okay. what's coming later on. So I'll, I'll leave you to continue some, some more slides. All right. Let's do a few more slides. Now, this is, um, this was a, um, a study in, in uh, Brazil. i um, and she did some simple improvements on their corrals, like cardboard that I showed you. Also simple changes in the cattle handling. No yelling and screaming. Yelling and screaming at cattle is very stressful. It has intent. They know you're mad at them. Where something like a hydraulic pump running doesn't have intent. I wanna get rid of dogs around the chutes and she got rid of electric prods and the stress hormone. The cortisol stress hormone was significantly reduced. And another thing is non-slip flooring. I cannot emphasize enough how important that is. Now let's go on to the next slide because we're going to get into now talking about some facility things. And when I first started in the industry in the 70s and the 80s, a lot of our cattle were extremely wild. And in the last 20 years in thief cattle in the U.S., there's been a lot of selection for calmer temperament. And a lot of the cattle we have now do not get scared as easily as some of the cattle we had 20 years ago. So I used to put solid sides on just everything. 
But now, now that we've calmed some of these animals down and in dairies, you can have a facility with an open side, but it's going to require more stockmanship skill. And I would strongly recommend covering the outer perimeters. And most of these places have buildings around them with walls on them. So that acts as a solid outer wall. Um, but you have to respect that flight zone. That kind of will be like a force field that's gonna come out through the fence. And it requires more skill. The next slide shows some curve systems that I have designed. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of correct layout. This is shown on my website. Um, has to be laid out correctly. Now, cattle on shape have a natural tendency to want to go back to where they came from. That's one of the reasons why curve shoot works, because they go on around back to where they come from. Another reason why it works is when they enter that single file, they can't see the people standing around with the vaccinating stuff. Let's go to the next slide. This is a really important slide, and it shows the right way and the wrong way to lay out a curve facility. And if you build it according to that dotted line, it will not work. It's got to be laid out correctly. And the radius or the size of the gate for the um, crowd pen, I, I like one that's 3.5 meters or 12 feet. You can go down to three meters or 10 feet, do not make them smaller than three meters. And these crowd pens laid out in a full half circle. So they come on around and they go back to where they came from. The next slide shows a very simple little curved facility. A lot of people have been asking me to come up with some things that are less expensive. This layout's on my website. It's also my book, um, Temple Grandin's Guide to Working with Farm Animals, which is available electronically on Amazon and other sites. Uh, but the way this works is you stand at the pivot of the crowd gate and you put the crowd gate on the first notch and then the cattle just come on around you and you're not on the catwalks. I'm 73 years old now. I have a hard time getting on and off those catwalks. And I, um, I really like this. I call it working the pivot. And there's a um, lot more information on this in grandon.com. Another thing that's nice about this layout is a lot of buildings have a series of poles to hold up the roof. And it's very easy to put this design in and have the poles go down the middle part of it. So you don't have to modify the building. Again, solid outer side, and then a partially open um, inner side. Now I'd rather put a solid side at least this far up on the bottom. I wanna keep their feet inside of it. I'd recommend that. The next slide shows another simple design where you can work the pivot. It's also on my website. And you work that whole inner part of that. But, and the solid black line is a solid um, outer fence. But again, you've gotta respect that flight zone that's extending out there and only enter it when you wanna move them. Now, a lot of people ask me all the time about the bud box. And this is something that's very, very simple to build. It's on the next slide. Very simple to build, but oh, now that's gotten, the, the slide's been compressed. I wanna tell you right now, the bud box is not a square. Some, the computer has compressed this slide for some reason. Um, my books have got uh, you know, the diagram of this done correctly. It's a rectangle but you still are using the same principle of them going back to where they come from. Now, this is an example of a design that's very economical to build, but it requires more stockmanship skill, especially if you're in there with them. You also absolutely cannot overfill it. You don't store cattle in it and you don't overfill it. You bring them in the back gate, you step through the back gate and they circle around you. Remember how I showed you that bubble earlier? And they fill up the single file chute. And what you put in the box has to fit in the chute. You don't want one left over going crazy because then you're going to get the separation distress problem and that can get dangerous. And you don't store cattle in this. It does take more skill to use, but it's very, very, very economical to build. You can make it out of portable panels. And we'll go on to the next slide. How about driving aids? Now, there's some people now working on low stress handling that recommend it out in the pastures and places like this, you don't even need driving aids. And one of the reasons why they recommend this is because people just can't stop doing this. 
And so they'll, they'll get them out there and have them, their hands at their side and just use slight positions of their body. Now, one place where I like a flag like that is where you can reach into a crowd pen from the outside and you turn an animal and not have to be in there with them. But you want to use it just slightly like this, not flapping. People seem to have a natural instinct to want to flap their arms. The next slide shows a survey that was done in the US. And they found that in places where they used electric prods all the time, you had a lot more stumbling, vocalization, uh, a lot of handling problems. Another thing that showed up in this survey is they had a lot of problems with vocalization and hydraulic squeeze chutes, and that's because they got the pressure too tight. You need to adjust hydraulic restraint equipment so that it automatically stops squeezing at a reasonable pressure. If an animal vocalizes when you squeeze it, you're hurting it. You need to put less pressure on it. The next slide just shows some more you know, curved facilities. And I'm emphasizing about um, keeping the outer perimeter solid. And the next slide, I just talk about design concepts. There's kind of two ways that I can design things. I can do something very simple, like the bud box, very economical, but requires more skill. Or I can do one of my curved facilities, a little more expensive, but they're easier for less skilled people to use, and, and, you're, and, and the people are not in with the cat. The next slide, I discuss some behavioral principles of restraint. I already talked about non-slip flooring, um, optimal pressure. You've got to hold it tight enough so it feels held. Uh, if you're using a squeeze chute where, where it squeezes, you've got to make sure you don't throw your animal off balance. If you throw it off balance, it's going to start to um, get scared. And then that piece of cardboard that I showed over the side of the chute, um, that's an example of, of something very simple I did, and it made the cattle come in more easily. And I'd experiment sometimes with pieces of cardboard. Um, because it can be a vehicle or a, I've seen cars going by on the road will cause blocking. The next slide shows a really nice non-slip floor. And we've already talked a lot about that. But now I want to test your power of observation. Now, I don't have any way of knowing if 887 people um, out there when they raise their hands. But if I was doing it live, I'm going to ask you, raise your hand. If you, if you noticed when I first put this slide up here, that that animal was looking at the sunbeam. Now it's obvious, I've told you. When I chose children this slide, over half of them will notice this. But this is the sort of stuff that would make a new heifer balk and refuse to move in the milking parlor. Where if you had a sunbeam like this, the old cows will just walk over. They've learned that that's not going to hurt them. I was wondering, I just saw you come up on the video. Do you have a question? I, I will ask one actually, because it is okay. related to this. Um, it, so what would you recommend as a non-slip flooring? I, I see she's got a mat to step onto. As she, as, There's a as... lot of different non-slip flooring options. That's a mat that will not be available in the UK. And now we've got a new company in the, in the, called Animat now at home and that sell different mats. There's a lot of different things available. Uh, on my website, I show grooved concrete, uh, uh, the steel rods. We still have to use that in some places because it's all they can get. Uh, you could even just use sand. Now, I we had a nice nice discussion about corrective actions in our meat plants, and uh, I might use sand at a meat plant to fix an icy loading ramp that day, but I don't want to be putting sand on that on that loading ramp all the time. I'm going to have to Put, put a better thing on it than sand. So sand might be a short-term corrective action, but on uh, a rubber mat might be a long-term uh, corrective action. There's a lot of different things. And one of the simplest things you can do is simply score slipping and falling. If you've got animals slipping and you've got animals falling, you've either got a slippery floor problem, you've got, you're getting them too excited, or maybe they're lame. So those are three things that you would need to fix. And the next slide shows handling scoring. And I like this um, data that was collected at some of our large beef feed yards. Now, electric pride use, I want that really low. Um, but you have a lot of animals slipping and falling or stumbling 
that's uh, going down and one knee uh, going down on the ground or miscaught on uh, vocalizing when you restrain them, you've got things that you need to fix. Now this was done with beef cattle. Now right now we're getting beef cattle bigger and bigger, heavier at a younger age, uh, breeding more from meat, and we've been getting heart attack problems and we've been getting a uh, leg and foot problems. I think we have to be careful how much we push animals for productivity. We gotta start looking at what's optimal because I gotta have an animal I can handle. And if I got an animal that's uh, leg problems, that can uh, make it very difficult to handle it. It's not gonna wanna walk because it's sore. Now I wanna just tell you one little thing. Normal cattle lay like this. When they lay on their chest or on the sternum, they lay like this on the sternum. If one leg is sticking out like this, they are sore because this is the normal way when they rest on their chest or their sternum. And if they're dog sitting with their butt on the ground and their two front legs like this, they're really sore. And that applies to shape too. And I've been seeing more problems with lameness. It's just um, it's a variety of factors causing it. And when I did my Improving Animal Welfare, a Practical Approach third edition book, which incidentally has just come out, Improving Animal Welfare, a Practical Approach third edition, published by Cabby in the UK. I looked up the lameness statistics for the UK and I have uh, bad news. It's not, uh, it's not improved very much. We still have to do a lot more work on this. And if you measure lameness, then you see it. If you don't measure it, you tend to underestimate it. Let's go on to the next slide. And that shows some very first work that we did on cattle temperament and an animal that rated at number four was an animal that got extremely fearful and agitated in the squeeze chute when we restrained it and it had lower weight gains. And when we did this 25 years ago, this was radical stuff. This has been replicated a whole bunch of times. Animal temperament matters. The next slide shows the core emotional systems. This is the Jack Panskep emotional systems. Already talked about fear, then you have anger, Usually that's not the problem with cattle, except the bull. You go out in the pasture and the bull comes after you, that's not fear. In fact, the worst bull for going after people is that orphan hand reared pet. Because when he grows up and he's got to prove he's the big man of the herd, he does it on people, usually men, with very, very tragic bad results. So orphan bull tabs, Get them in with a group of other cattle. They got to grow up knowing that they are cattle. And then you have seek. I already discussed that. And then, of course, you've got sex drive. And you've got mother young nurturing and caring. You've got that licking the calf. And then you've got play. And these are scientifically you know, determined emotional systems. Both genetics and experience affects these. An animal with high fear genetics, I don't care whether it's a horse, a dog, any kind of an animal, if you suddenly introduce novelty, like an umbrella opening, animal with a flighty genetics will have a bigger reaction than the animal with the calmer genetics. The next slide on, uh, shows a really nice purebred Brahmin. These actually have a, if you treat them right, they really like stroking by people. I'll give you a little hint. Don't pat animals like this, stroke it stroke it, make it feel like the mother's tongue. The next slide shows uh, cortisol levels during restraint. Now, what I wanna get across in this slide is that when you just force animals to do stuff, it really stresses them. And when animals are trained to cooperate like dairy cows are, then you don't get the fear stress. And when you force them, you get all kinds of fear stress. Stockmanship matters. Let's go to the next slide. It's really important that a heifer's first experience with something new, like the milking room, is a good first experience. Because if its first experience is falling on a butt, you might have problems. So new first experiences with new people, new equipment, like, like milking room, and new vehicles, like a trailer, need to be good first experiences. And there's been some work on acclimating heifers to the milking parlor, but one of the mistakes they made is they didn't feed them. 
all the robot milking now, they feed them. The biggest mistake we made, we made this back in the 80s in the US, was taking out, taking feed out of the milking parlor. You know what's happening? People are learning they need to put it back in. You know, there's some, sometimes that I'm gonna re you know, the young students are coming in now and they're gonna reinvent something that we should have never have taken out. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I can't emphasize the importance of stockmanship. There's all kinds of research, both old research and new research that shows that good stockmanship really pays. And uh, Miriam Parker is an excellent stock person. You're gonna be hearing from her. She would agree with me on this. Stockmanship doesn't get enough credit. Go on to the next slide. Now, the thing about a new thing is if I take something like a camera box or a tripod and I put it out in the middle of the pasture, the cattle come up to it. So novelty is attractive when they can voluntarily approach it. And it's scary if you just suddenly shove it in their face. And so one of the best ways to introduce animals to new things is to let them approach it. And I get asked all the time, well, my heifer was good at home. And when I showed her at the show, she went berserk. Well, let's get her used to some of the things at the show, like flags, bikes, and balloons. The next slide just shows an umbrella and, uh, and a canvas. And if you train a cow to tolerate the umbrella, that doesn't transfer to the tarp or the canvas. They're totally different things, and they look completely, completely different. Let's go to the next slide. Dogs around the working area, I just cannot stand them. Now I've seen really good dogs out in the field, the border collie type of dogs in the field, but around the where I'm gonna be vaccinating them, it just makes the animals crazy. The next slide, I just talk about the importance of uh, acclimating animals to um, different people, different vehicles, because some of the worst cattle to go berserk when they go somewhere new are the ones that have lived through shelter to life. And they've only seen one farmer and one truck. They've not, and they haven't seen anything else new. You take them to a new place and they get completely scared. Let's go to the next slide. You manage things that you measure. We can measure handling. We can also measure things like lameness, body condition. I've got a student right now working on udder edema, which is a non-infectious swelling of the udder. This is another problem that's creeping up on us. So we get more and more high producing cows and this occurs where there's no infection, but you'll kick the milker off. And my student owns a dairy. And that's one of the reasons why she decided to study this. And a lot of people don't even realize that it exists. You, you measure things, it prevents bad from becoming normal. And I think lameness is one of those things where bad became normal. Now this just shows how I made some changes in some handling equipment and I reduced the vocalization. On the big bar graph there, I reduced pressure on the neck applied by a head stanchion. And when I did this, uh, then the moving went away. I put a light on an entrance because they didn't want to go into that dark movie theater. And then um, less cattle were vocalizing because they weren't poking them with electric prods. Let's go to the next slide. Now this is uh, McDonald's audits that I did in the US and we scored meatpacking plants on their performance. And when I first started and collected baseline data for the USDA, captive bolt stunning was atrocious because the equipment was broken. And then when you had big buyers looking at this, then things got a whole lot better. A whole lot better. And, and a lot of the things that we did to improve the handling scores, vocalization, slipping and falling, a lot of non-slip flooring, a lot of training, a lot of very, very simple things. Let's go to the next slide. Now there's kind of three different types of animal welfare standards. And the tendency now is to go with what's called an animal-based outcome standard. Lameness would be that. Slipping and falling is an outcome standard. I'm not gonna tell you how to build a floor, but I can measure slipping and falling. And I'll tell you one thing that does not work. Just a little bit of a rough broom finish on concrete does not work. That gets slick. 
and uh, the OIE is going to be going more towards um, outcome-based variables. And I know that um, EFSA and the EU are going more towards outcome-based variables. Some of this has been delayed by uh, COVID. Then you have some practices you just forbid. I do a lot of work with large customers, and we've got to have some very clear thou shalt nots. And if you do these thou shalt nots, um, that you may no long, may not be a supplier any longer. And getting away from input measures like telling you exactly how to build a cubicle in, in a barn for a cow to lay in. Now, if there's something wrong with that cubicle, then she's likely to be dirty or have swollen joints or be lame. Let's go to the next slide. Now, here are some of the critical control points for cattle will. Handling, scoring, that's gonna be one of them swollen leg joints, lameness, filthy, dirty animals, embedded pack systems. We've got to make sure you put enough bedding in there so your animals stay clean. Body condition, ammonia levels, I just, I, uh, you just about have to measure that with a meter, but everything's an outcome measure there except the ammonia measure. Heat stress, if cattle at rest breathe with their mouth open, they are too hot, period and coat condition. We've been using that in organic operations, um, you know, where people get too accustomed to looking at lice and stuff like that and thinking that's normal. No, that's not normal. Um, so you're gonna need to have a nice coat on your animals. And these are very, very easy things to look at. So what are kind of the steps for improving animal welfare? The first thing I got to do to improve it is I gotta make sure no acts of abuse are going on. You know, now the animal, Activists are getting into more and more places. And what they just did, one of them, they just recently got into a chicken growing place and they showed us pictures of, uh, you know, little chicks that were having problems. They were having a harder and harder time actually finding something wrong with a grower. Uh, implementing scoring. And then in cattle, we don't really have to worry too much about behavior needs in dairy cattle. Uh, this is a bigger problem in the laying hen and in the pegs. And do animals have positive emotions? I'll tell you how to find some positive emotions with dairy cattle. Go on to YouTube and look up a cow motorized grooming brush. And I'm not supposed to say as a scientist that cows love these brushes, but when you watch these videos, they obviously love these brushes and they'll line up and wait to use it. You know, so that's positive emotions. So it's not enough just to prevent abuse or to prevent suffering. We also have to look at it and go, are we giving those animals a good life? You know, this is the five domains from uh, David Malore, which has a lot of similarities to welfare quality. And he's added, you know, the importance of looking at, see the animal have a life worth living. You know, have some time to have some, some experiences of things it would like to do. And I think I've got one last slide. And that's my website, grandon.com. Everything on that is free. And we are now open up for questions. And we've got um, uh, we got over half an hour for questions. That's fantastic. That's the, the fantastic pace of those slides too, sister. Thank you, Temple. I think we've we've got to, we've covered a lot of ground there in just those few minutes. Um, but uh, we have had a lot of questions. Um, sure. We so the. the the, the word in the UK, of course, is TB. Oh, those two words. Um, TB testing. How could we make that a less stressful uh, scenario? So if you can imagine the vets up, up at the head end of the animal, they are clipping uh, in one particular area and injecting two inoculants. Well, how could we make that? Trained to procedures, and that's probably not, you're not going to train them for really painful procedures. The worst cattle I ever saw to get them into a facility were some where too many students had palpated them and you could not get them out as a crowd pet. Worst cattle, worse than anything I've seen at the slaughterhouse, they were the worst. But something that's just a bit uncomfortable and painful, uh, they can get acclimated to it. Feed them a reward when they come out. Feed them a reward. They're doing that in Brazil right now with a really uh, flighty um, uh, Malor cattle, um, Mateus. Um, uh, uh, Lacosta's uh, doing that. Uh, give them a reward. 
You see, it goes so, back to why did we take feeding out of the milking parlor? I thought it was the stupidest thing we ever did. Because there's yeah. a study that was done where they tried to acclimate heifers just running through there before they started milking, and, and the more flighty heifers uh, got stressed. You feed them in there. No, you come out of there and you're going to get it like you get a half a coffee cup of some delicious grain. It's a treat that you're not, not normally allowed to have. No, that that's a whole lot on that. But they you have to use something that they've learned from experience is a treat. Boy, I can tell you for our cows, the thing I call cooner flakes it comes from the local feed yard. In one of my labs, I couldn't figure out why we couldn't get the cattle to leave the cattle handling building. And they kept turning to the right. There was a big bucket of cooner flakes over there I didn't know about. And they were smelling them. They wanted them. They didn't care how many students were in that cattle handling barn. Cooner flakes are just so yummy. That's the name of a local feed yard. <laughs> Now, I, when you say it, it 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 seems so clear because we do it with our dogs, don't we? So um, we we could easily give them the last treats, I think. Well, let's um, start giving them some treats, and because that's it, that's not going to be a painful procedure like too many students doing palpation. Hmm. And it happened about 15 years ago, and that professor no longer works here, but they were in one of my labs. 15, they were the worst cattle, and. You couldn't get them in single file. I had to have three of the guys push them in. They would not go. But the TV thing isn't that, you know, uh, it's a crippled clippers are a bit scary and I'm. Um, but, but we can, but we can acclimatize. Not, it's an uncomfortable procedure, but. I see. So, so actually there's a question related to that. Um, it, it's about negative experiences for that animal like you you touched on it when you were saying about um make sure you run heifers through through the milking parlor get them used to it um without any negative experiences and i'm assuming this could be included in that so how do you stop cattle from bulking at the head yoke so in a in a new handling well, setup the cattle some of the worst cattle for balking at the head yoke are ones that have been bashed on the head by it i actually did a little study on that we had some bulls that we had to work every 30 days. So I went down and I kept track of who got accidentally hit with the head head holder. And the ones that got hit with the head holder, they'd go in the squeezing part and they'd come up the head holder and they're going like this. They remembered. They remembered. And the other thing that's just so important, I want animals walking up the head yoke, not running. And I just... Um, been uh, doing my class and I've been getting a lot of discussion on the on the discussion board about animals uh, hitting the head gate or the head yoke uh, too hard. Well, have, bring them in quietly. This is where the person who's working the back end is important. You know, you have a bunch of yelling and screaming and like, then they're going to come in there fast. I want them walking in. No, I see. I see. No, well, I, I, so, I mean, it related to that, I mean, we, we've spoken about um, wild cattle or cattle that perhaps would go a bit too quick into the into the head yoke what about pain cattle if you bang them on the head with it hard they're going to remember that because the thing that was interesting the animal knew exactly which part of that restraint apparatus was bad and they went into the squeezing part fine but the part this part here instead of getting them here had got them here and they remembered that i call it nutcrackering them they got bashed here and they remembered yeah no i can i can believe it i think we've all seen it and it's um it's never pleasant um but the other end of the spectrum if, you, if you've got a, a herd of dairy cows and they're perhaps you think they're too quiet they're difficult you can never get them to move anywhere is that a problem is that a bad thing well then there's a point where you got to use feed to move them and uh, they'll go in there if they're going to get fed and then in the 70s one of the big innovations we had was the dairy cow that didn't want to leave the stall. So they had these things called automatic feed bowl covers that where a little gate would swing over and cover up the feed bowl to get her to leave. And then in the 80s, they just took it all out. And now I think we're realizing that this was a mistake because when the robotic milking came in, that's all got feed in it. No, I see, I see. No, I, I can, I mean, I, you often see it, don't you? Um, 
I know when we've spoken in the past on the lead up to this webinar, we were talking about what what characteristics are best for people who are working with animals. Um, what what characteristics would would you say make the best stock people? Well, a calm person. There's an old study that was done years ago by a guy named Seabrook, and he found the confident introvert made one of the best dairy stock people, and sort of happy Charlie kind of excited done. Um, you know, wasn't wasn't so good. But some people just have a real way with animals. Also, there is a confidence. Uh, if you're afraid of them, they pick up, and you kind of approach them with a confidence. They pick up on that. They're very sensitive to body language, and uh, you no. Know, but some people are much better stock people than others. And um, there's a professor here, a new professor named Courtney Daigle at Texas A&M University, and and one thing she's working on is try to improve the status of the stock people. It's not just a job for flunkies. No. You know, now I've been in this industry for a long time and and there's some places that are raising the, the status and the pay of the of a really good stock person. Because stockmanship matters. What I have learned is when I was out there selling equipment all over the place, I found it was easy to sell equipment. People want the thing more than they want the management. And I put a lot of equipment out there and some of my clients tore it up and wrecked it because they thought they could save everything. They could just buy capital investments that would solve their problems magically. I don't care if it's equipment, whether it's computers or drugs, you know, whatever. And getting people to manage things right, it's hard. And then when I started working with the McDonald's audits in the meat plants, what we did there is we forced them to manage them. Because most of the stuff we did was simple things like flooring, lighting, smaller groups, training. And only three out of 75 plants had to build something expensive. And three plant managers had to go. And after those uh, places got their manager ectomy, things greatly improved. And that is strictly management. I see. I see. Yeah. I, I, when I first started in the 70s, I used to think I could build self managing cattle handling facilities. That is rubbish. Yes. So management's got to get behind things. Also, we cannot understaff and overwork. If people get too tired, and there's been some industry data that's never been published in chickens and in pigs, that after six hours spending loading these animals out, People got tired and the deads went up. Oh, I see. No, I can I can believe it. Yeah, I think it's a it's a common problem, and we never we never give ourselves enough time to do some of these jobs um, as well. You it's, you always think it's going to be a quick job, but it's uh, it ends up being more difficult. Well, the old thing, slow is faster. Yes. And the other yeah. thing is, slow is you're less likely to end up in the hospital too, or get an animal hurt. Yeah. Yes. So an, another question here about uh, about the bud box. I'm really interested to see that. Gordy Jones spoke about that when he was over uh, several years back, um, and I've I've seen it really successfully used. But do you ever get the problem where cows become acclimated to using that same handling system, that same bud box, and therefore they say, "Oh well, I know this drill. I'm I'm not going to." I'm not going to well, play one anymore. One place where a bud box doesn't work very well is when you've got cattle that absolutely don't want to go in there, like a hospital where you've had the you know a beef feed yard hospital, uh, because you've got to make the bud box really work right. You've got to have some flight zone a little bit so you get that circling around you. The other thing is you absolutely cannot store cattle in it. What you put in the box must immediately turn around and fill up the lead up race with no leftovers. That's no. really, really important. That's why some people use those double alleys because the user right is gonna force you to have better stockmanship because it won't work at all if you don't use it right. Now that other little layout I showed where you come on around, that is, um, um, that kind of does some of the same things as the bud box does where you stand at the pivot point of the single file, uh, shoot, let's see, maybe, I just hold this up here, one of my books right here. Um, I don't know how well you can see this, but this little layout right here, um, you stand at the pivot point of the crowd gate 
and you kind of do some sort of the same thing as the bud box not in there with them and then if you need to, i like to put the crowd gate on the first notch and just leave it there i see you know I see. And, and and that uh, but you cannot overfill a bud box and you i mean if five cattle fit in your lead up race that's how many you put in the bud box you don't put six in the bud box and have a leftover i'm with you no i, I think it makes makes complete sense and um, you have to have um you have to have a man gate so that you can uh, get out of there easily a little small uh, gate for a person and then absolutely. that back gate that you shut the back crowd gate regardless of the design should be solid perfect and these designs are are you know they're in this and then well uh, they're in my guide to working with farm animals and there's and it's quicker drawings, there's a lot of drawings online where that's wrong and i don't know what the computer did to that diagram of the bud box but it's not a square it somehow compressed it it didn't do it to the other other slides no um, i think yeah, that's okay i think it, i it just went wrong with that picture but i i think we've got pictures and they're, they're on this website of yours as well when we can well, they're on they then they're in here i've got one in here that's uh show you one that's laid out correctly because okay here's a bud box that's laid out correctly now this but, image is like kind of backwards there it is laid out correctly i see i yeah. see and and i uh, and, and then the curve facilities have to be laid out correctly. No, de definitely. I of, think... uh, there's a lot of drawings that people have put online that, that aren't to scale either. These drawings in Guide to Working with Farm Animals are to scale. I see. I see. So th so thank you for that. I think we've we've covered some of the cattle handling um, points. Um, do you have any thoughts on whistling to move cattle? I, I mean, you often see that that used with both with dairy and beef cattle. Oh, I'd rather not do it. You know, I'd rather just be really quiet, maybe a little. Ch -ch -ch. And um, I, I had to stop one of my students from doing that with our beef cattle because it got them too too hot. I think we need to try to get away from noise coming out of our mouths as much as we can. I'm not going to say never do it, but most of the time you don't need to do that. No, no, I understand. I, yeah, there's a difference between walking between some dairy cows and talking to them so they know you're there. Well, talking and, to them, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. But all the arm waving, yelling, um, you know, when you whistle at them, all the heads come up, the ears go up, and you know, absolutely question whether you really need to do that. There is a question about kicking cattle, or not, not us kicking the cattle, kicking us. Um, how can you stop a, a cow kicking you when you walk past? She just when you walk past, she's kicking you. Yes. Um. Well, then there's a point where you have to decide you're going to keep that cow or not. Just one cow, and she kicks at you. you see, and there may be something in her in her past that we're, she she doesn't like you. Now you, I mentioned the utter edema. Um, that uh, can make the udder sore and there can be no mastitis present and they might kick at you because they're sore. Yes, yeah, so and, and you mentioned... Buy them and, and, and kicking at you. See, this is why in in troubleshooting behavior problems, I got to know exactly where the kicking is taking place. Because walking by kicking at you is something totally different than kicking a milker off absolutely no I, I i think we you do occasionally get a rogue rogue animal that'll do it but you spoke about dogs um earlier oh, oh dogs train cattle to kick you get cattle in a like in a single file race and a dog biting it that will train them to kick you this is one of the reasons why i don't like dogs and even train you to, to kick with both back feet and i've had beef cattle almost twice kill me that have been bitten by dogs and both back feet came flying up. And one yeah. of one of those feet got a guy's hat and flipped it up in the air. Yeah, it, now, it's, it's up like to me. Border Collie out in the field, working the flight zone really nice. I'm, I'm fine with that, that's good, I've seen that. But dogs biting cattle where they can't get away, all it does is teach them to kick. And then I might have to get rid of the cows, it's just too dangerous. 
absolutely no i yeah i can i can see what you mean it's happened to me as well um we've we've spoken quite a lot about cows um i'm, I'm getting a few questions about calves one of the problems with a calf um is one of the first times you handle it you put a tag in its ear it's a negative experience how can we make that first experience of being handled more positive that, if you do it the day it's born that calf is so young it may not remember now once it gets to be a month old it's going to remember but when it's first born i i don't think they remember i get asked that question all the time okay and, and so, so with that in mind are there is there any difference in the way that you might handle calves up to four months old compared to handling cattle or are they just mini cattle well if they're four months old they're starting to turn into mini cattle now real little calves um now calves a month old is going to remember stuff but when you're doing it uh, you know right when they're born i i don't think they remember it and i've been asked that question that question a whole lot now there has been some research on on, on dehorning with a, with a pain relief and the research is very clear. It reduces the stress hormones and it reduces pain related behaviors. And another problem you've got with cattle, since they're a prey species animal, they tend to cover up the fact that they hurt if they know you're watching. Yes. Uh, unless they really trust the stock person. If they really trust the stock person, then they may show you they're hurting. But I saw a situation one time where I hid in a scale house and they were castrating some bulls and um, and they were rolling around on the ground, ground moaning and when i come out of that scale house they jumped up and acted normal they didn't know i was in the scale house i went in there before they brought the cattle up but if they they sheep are really bad about this that's why people say find today dead tomorrow yes as they cover up the they're a prey species animal they don't want to tell a potent, potential predator that they're herding and so they see you coming, they a lot of times cover it up. Now, of course, some of these lame dairy cattle can't cover it up, but these no. animals, I was shocked at how moaning on the ground, jumped up and acted normal. No, I, I think I think it's it's clear to see. We often see it. And of course, when you push them, apply some pressure, you know, that that slight lameness disappears. They they yeah, walk on. Slight lameness to disappear. Yeah, that's right. So uh, I'm still getting plenty of questions about handling systems. Um, there's a question about self-locking yolks. There's, there's a guillotine yolk and a self-locking yolk. We have do the you, same thing. Do, do you prefer a self-locking yolk? Is, Some is of there... this is personal preference on these yolks, but it's really important on a self-locking to adjust it correctly so that it doesn't pinch too tight on the neck. Um, uh, if it's a really wild beef cattle, I probably wouldn't use one of those. And then some people will just work it manually. You know, the bottom line is I want to make sure that I don't bash them with the thing. And the thing you've got to be, another thing you got to be careful on self-locking is if you adjust it too wide, you can then get it locked like with one leg across here like that. And that's a terrible mess. And they're going to remember yes. that. Uh, yeah. Some of this is personal preference. There's a, a lot of different latches on these devices, and you can have ratchet latches. They're noisy, but they they don't come undone. Then there's some other types of latches that work with just friction. You never oil those. And some of these latching mechanisms, if they get worn, you need to replace them. Because when they all of a sudden open up suddenly, uh, levers go flying and people end up, the teeth knocked out and end up in the hospital. So keeping those latching mechanisms maintained is really important. No, you can, you can see that certainly, even just from a health and safety perspective for the, the users. Um, the, I've, there is a question about walking platforms um, on the outside of shoots. Um, I know, I've often seen these in larger beef type systems. Yeah. Um, do you have any views on those? Is that is that a positive or a negative? Well, there's a tendency now for, on some of the facilities that I would put that on the crowd pen, uh, but on the single file, what a lot of people are doing now, solid on the outside. You know, and most of the cattle in the UK and in Ireland are going to be uh, not as wild as some of the cattle we may have on 
far western ranges, um, and then and no walking platform along the single file race. You just work that on the ground, and then that this uh, diagram that I showed you with the uh, where you work the pivot on um, on this little diagram right here. There's no one. Um, this uh, this is backwards to zoom. That's why I'm having a hard time positioning it. I uh, there's no walking platform on this except one little place where you might step on a little platform right where the pivot point is because I don't want you putting your hand through the bars because right. an animal can go and break your forearm. I want you reaching over the bars, but that would just be a little step up place. I see, I see. Yeah, so you can- And you now can... there's other places in big meat plants, yeah, I'm gonna have to have walking platforms. You see, this you is can... where different things work well in different places. See, absolutely. So you can manipulate the, um, the flight zone much more easily from inside the handling facility without having to step up. Yeah, that's right. But I want the outer side all closed in either with a building wall. One of the worst things to mess up handling is I'll park the vehicles alongside something with open sides. That does not work very well. I see. So that doesn't the, work, work at all. And, and uh, but uh, like on our facility, we have a walking platform and solid sides on the round crowd pen. And then along the single file, you can work that on the ground. And one of the things I have to show the students is don't stand up there on top of that thing, right up close to those cattle because they're going to get nervous because you're inside their flight zone. And it's amazing. You've got a chute that's got an open side on it. I can back up like a meter or a meter and a half and they calm right down. And then I step forward too much. I start seeing them jumping around and start doing some pooping and flipping their tails around. Okay. No, I see. I see. Um, there's, there is a question. Um, and plants, I'm going to just make it solid. You've got too much commotion going around, put walking platforms on it. It's no, just too much activity usually in a bagging plant. I've got a question about turning left or turning right. Okay, and it's 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 not about um, it's so do cows prefer to go left or right? Is that a myth or is that true? I think the most important thing is if you have two facilities on your property, make sure they both turn in the same direction. Now there has been some research on laterality. Remember when you studied high school biology, your eye optic tracks cross. So your right eye goes to your left brain and your left eye goes to your um, right brain. And the old thing about right brain, left brain people, well, there's some of this in cattle. And the right brain is the side of the brain that like looks for scary stuff and things that might be bad. And the left brain sort of more of the seek. So when they're kind of afraid of something, I'll use the left eye going to the right brain. And uh, now I think if you've got really tame cattle and you've really worked on, I think learning will override most of that. But they had, there was a study done on dairy cattle where they put a man in the exit alley of the milking shed and they tended, the ones that were flighty tended to go by them so they could watch them with the left eye because maybe he was bad. I see. Yeah, it's okay. called eye laterality. Actually, the interest, and I do have a little bit of stuff on this in, in Temple Grand's Guide to Working with Farm Animals. Um, if you're interested in looking that stuff up, you can go on Google Scholar and just type in cattle, eye laterality, those three key words. But I'm not going to, as of right now, um, redo every cattle handling facility over this. No. You know, in the practical world, um, you, if you have two, I tell ranchers, if you're going to have two corrals on your ranch, let's have them both work the same way because animals learn the path through it. I don't want it going totally different, opposite direction in one corral. Okay. No, I see. No, that's that's perfect. Thank you. Um, I've got some, some more questions here about um, the... I've lost my train of thought there for a moment. Um, well, I've... So, so uh, I'll ask you this question about um, people. So, why do, do we have to keep reinforcing these messages? Um, you, you've you've been doing this now for a number of years, and and we we still have to repeat the same messages. I think 
think it's a lot like traffic. The police still have to have speed cameras and be monitoring speed and monitoring drunk driving and monitoring stopping violations. I think it's kind of the same thing. What I have found in training people on livestock handling is you've got a few people, they are the superb stock person. I mean, someone like Miriam Parker. Then you've got other people where you constantly have to keep um, kind of it's sort of like the police have to constantly monitor the speed. And then there's a few people that I don't think should be handling livestock. They like to be mean to them. And when we worked on those McDonald's audit cells, now 1999, over 20 years ago, I uh, had to get rid of 10% of the people. They just would not put the electric prod away. Then they went to uh, video auditing and another round of people were gotten rid of because they just would keep poking them with the electric product um, and doing rough things to them. I see. But I find that they did this survey in Texas, 39 feed yards, two years ago. There was a survey done. And they found about 60 or 70 percent of the people were doing things right. That's good. That's a lot better than that would have been 20 years ago or 10 years ago, because our cattle association has done lots and lots of low stress handling workshops and lots of stuff on beef quality assurance training people. So that's the good news. But there's still 20 or 30 percent that stand in front of the head and poke the butt and put too many cattle in the crowd pen and yell at cattle and bang the side of the facility with stick. I see. We, we still had people, then I've had uh, people that are new going into the industry, oh, Dr. Granner, and she just talks about the same old stuff. Then that new person comes in, spends three years out in the field going around everywhere. Now I know why Temple always talks about the same stuff because yeah. she gets frustrated. She's gone around to all these facilities where, that her company owns. And she's like, come oh, back there and fix the same stuff. You know, Absolutely. We still always have to talk about basics. It, there's a slip. There's a, yeah, and you become it, used to it, it, seeing it, things. It slips. It's like the speeding would gradually increase. Yeah. And I think traffic rules and stuff is a good way to look at it because can you imagine if the police just stopped uh, uh, monitoring for drunk driving? Why well, we'd have car crashes all over the place. Absolutely. No, I, I think it's a it's a human nature thing, a psychology thing there. Um, I'm, I'm getting still some more questions about leader we're cows. Fine. and We're fine for time. We're fine for time for a moment. I'm we've, fine. We've, I'm we've got another 10 minutes and I can stay a little longer if you want. No, well, well, well we will aim. To, we'll, we'll finish at half past eight, um, but we'll, okay. we'll just have another few more questions. And then uh, so uh, leader and dominant cows. Um, I've got one person who is sending their leader cow, the, the cow they believe is their leader cow away, and presumably the herd will then, another one will establish itself as, as the new leader. Yeah, they will. They'll establish a new leader. That may take, may take some time. You see, the thing that a lot of people find surprising is that the leader is usually not the dominant cow at the feed trough. Right. No, I, so I remember. You, so you said that a moment ago, yeah. and, the, and the and when you were talking about that, um, it it appeared like they're the same cow all the time. And well, they were. I they mean, are. And right at, when we first got numerically numerical ear tags, when we first when those got real when they first started getting them, and you you know the rancher go out and buy two hundred ear tags, numbered like one, two, three, four sequential numbered ear tags. They were really shocked that when the cows came back the next year, they were almost in the same order coming through the um, handling chute for vaccinations mm -hmm. because they put these uh, ear, sequential numbered ear tags in. And I had several ranchers say that they were just shocked that Gosh. they were almost in the same order. It's, no, well, that's it's, and it, and it, so it doesn't change. So even if groups change, that leader cow well, will they, always. They, well, they, they, if you, put enough new cattle in there, that's going to change things mm. in another animal. But they it's the high seek, likes to explore, kind of bold. That's the one that oftentimes will lead. I and see. you'll notice um, I've, I've done a lot of aerial flights over different parts of the U.S. and, and even in Ireland, uh, they make cows make those little paths where the little paths about this wide, they need to walk in single file. Uh, down these little paths. I see. I see. No, that's uh, 
that's brilliant yeah and you can you go over a small plane and you can see that um i've got i've got loads of questions coming in because oh, well, but... i can't see the chat no I... that's it no no really you you're best not to it's, it's a busy place um okay. i've got um so there's another another question here about enrichment and i think it's important we cover this all right let's um, do I know some people who put um, balls up for calves and the like, and uh, you've, you've already spoken about cow brushes. What would you, is, is there anything else you would recommend as positive enrichment for either calves or cows? They like long hay, the long stuff. And one of the problems we've got right now with some of our beef feedlots is they're chopping the hay up like this, like that bad. And we're having some very bad liver problems and they're doing it to get feed conversion but we we're, we've also selecting more and more and more for meat so we've had some leg problems we're getting heart uh, congestive heart failure and uh this is just pushing the biology too hard yes and the liver right. abscesses have got, uh, some of the liver problems are out of control now no i see i see no well i, I think it, it is a bit of a challenge isn't it it's uh well, you see, what happens is they're doing that to reduce the amount, of the, the, you know, the, improve the feed ratio. Yes. You know? But you see, the same issue has come up in chickens. Well, at what point have you pushed this system too far? And and in chickens, they've learned they got to back off a little bit. Now, going back to slow-growing chickens and increase your feed 20%, that's not very good from a sustainability standpoint. But with some of these cattle, you're getting, um, you're really starting to get into some problems. I mean, if you have an animal that dies uh, a week before slaughter, uh, he's got zero weight gain. No, absolutely. That's not, very, that's not very, very efficient. And I think what's happened, it's bad becoming normal. It's just like the lameness creeping up or traffic if you were not, you know, uh, monitoring for speed. It, it, it happens slowly. It's the same things happen with the bulldog. We bred for more and more of a big ad smashed in face. Now they can't walk, can't breathe. Even after they do the surgery, they still can't breathe. That's bad becoming norm. And it creeps up slowly and you don't realize the mess you're kind of getting in. And beef cattle have got some issues now that um, I 20 years ago would have never dreamed would be a problem. You know, when I see an animal welfare issue right now at a meat packing plant, it's something I have to fix at the farm. They didn't get lame on the truck. Don't blame the truckers for this. No. They didn't cause it. It has to be corrected at the farm. And some of it's genetics, and some of it is how they're fed, and growth promotes going overboard with that. I've um, there's a, another question that uh, I'll perhaps make my last question. I think because I've I've got a one or two things just to say at the end. Um, the um, in the when I w watched the film, um, I think it was it was your f uh, film about your life. There was a a moment in it where your family were using a squeeze crush uh, yeah. for cows. Um, is that something that you you feel is a is a definite positive for using with with cattle? Does it, does it genuinely have a an effect? Well, I think. The Yes, it does. And uh, now lots of times dairy cows are so tame, you don't need to. But beef cattle that aren't so tame, uh, first of all, it keeps them just flinging themselves all around. Now, I've come over to the UK where they've gotten them and, they, and the people are really pleased with it. The other thing that that movie showed is it showed how I was a visual thinker. You see, everything I think about is a picture. See, right now I'm seeing some farms that I went to in the UK on a trip. Uh, especially for cattle that have got any wildness at all, that's where the squeeze really works well. And you have to make sure that you don't throw them off balance with it. Some of the cheaper ones, just one side squeezes, and that can throw a cow off balance. And then if you've got really, a lot of our animals right now are really broad, the, the, the angus are really broad. We have, we have a squeeze crush that can pivot at the bottom and squeeze like, you know, pivot at the bottom or ones where the sides come in parallel. Now, if we use something like this in dairy, I would get the ones where the straight sides that move in in parallel. 
I see. I see. Because it's easier for them to walk in and out of that. Where the ones that are V'd at the bottom, it's harder for them to walk in and out of that. No, it, it, it was the one thing that struck me about that the, the film the, was the the effect that it was having on those ranch cattle. So, um, well, so. And they they you know if you've got a completely tame dairy cattle, and you've got to put a non-slip floor in there because you'll get these little slips like this, and they are absolutely getting completely scared. And you'll watch one of the feet, and it'll just be going like this. I've seen that on single animal scales too, and the animal is just completely scared. And then you just put one thing in there to stop that little side slip like this, they calm right down. No, but that's I've heard it. A lot of your situation, you can get the ones where the sides stay straight. We use a lot of the V-shaped ones, but we get, we still get quite a lot of very wild cattle coming in. And one issue that we've had, and this is not good, is we've had some grass people grow a steer up to three years old and never handle it. And that is a wild animal and you've got to bring it into market. And that's a that's a big mess, you know. They they yeah. know you need to have people walking out amongst cattle on the pasture and get them used to people on the on the pasture. Then another problem we've had has been we have cattle on western ranches where they only worked on a horse, and they're really nice and calm. And then when they see the first person on foot, they take of off. Course. The flight zone will go from two meters to twenty meters when they yes. see the person because a person on a horse looks totally different than a person on the ground absolutely i i think it's i know there's so much more that we could talk about um this evening and i i think i'm afraid time has beaten us and and i'm gonna have to to pull some of these questions to to a close um so it's been really interesting temple thank you so much for your for your time tonight it's been such an amazing insight um and Please, could I just remind all dairy farmers about the uh, the focus group uh, that Miriam, that uh, Temple's mentioned Miriam tonight, Miriam Parker uh, is going to be delivering uh, with us. Um, these are 30 people groups. It's going to be delivered online um, and it's uh, the 24th of February, 11.30 till 1.30. And those, if you're watching this, take a picture of this slide if you can those are the details to to sign up if you're a beef farmer you can you can let us know um you email email in the same way or phone call um and we'll uh, we'll aim to try and accommodate you where we possibly can um if you've got any questions uh, related to today we're keen to to hear those uh, we'll we'll try to answer as many as we possibly can after today um but um but we, we're really keen for your feedback too. Uh, there's two more webinars in this series. The, the next two webinars are live only. Uh, you are going to miss out. Uh, they're not being recorded um, if you don't listen live. We've got Neil Chesterton uh, from New Zealand, from, from Lame Cow in New Zealand on the 16th of February. That's next week. It's exactly the same time slot. And Jörp Driesen from Cow Signals in the Netherlands on the 2nd of March. Um, in a moment, uh, when when the webinar ends, uh, there will be feedback form at the end. So please do fill it in uh, and let us know what your thoughts are for, for this evening and let us know what more you would like to see. Um, thank you, Temple, once again. Um, it's It's been a fantastic insight. I've really w enjoyed working with you on this. Um, and thank you, everybody, for spending your evening with us. And, well, uh, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed uh, talking to everybody. Thank you. Uh, and, and goodbye. Bye. I'll phone bye. you in a moment. Goodbye. Okay, thank you. Yeah, bye.